Great to see everybody on this rainy day. You know, the one thing I was thinking about, Michael, it should my, uh, like, I think we're supposed to get uh, thunderstorms today in Toronto. So should I suddenly hey. disappear? Um, da, 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 da. I know you'll be able to carry the torch without me until I can come back online. <laughs> I have uh, several musical numbers for prepared. Um, <laughs> we'll just sing through the entire score of Oklahoma. Beautiful. Okay, so this is the, the people who are signing in didn't know they might be in store for a musical today. There Welcome, everybody. We're just going to give it another minute or two for people to come on in. But uh, in the chat, feel free to drop us uh, where you're calling in from. Where are you listening to this from today? Um, put your location in the chat so we can know. And add an exclamation mark if you're wearing stretchy pants. Um, that seems to be, I, I, I've now referred to things as soft pants and hard pants, and uh, I've got a lot of soft, I don't think I've, I don't think I've spent so much money on leisure wear in my life as I have over the last year, I have to tell you that, let me tell you. <laughs> so we got Quebec City in the house, awesome, Raleigh, North mm -hmm. Carolina, fantastic, Dundas, Oh, I love Dundas. Great house pricing going on in Dundas. Good investment on your homes if you're living out in Dundas, that's for sure. Halls Harbor, Nova Scotia. Oh, that sounds like I just the name of it. I want Doesn't to sound like it does sound much. Like. Oh, it sounds magical. <laughs> and then Brandon, oh, Jessica Brandon Fletcher too. lives there. <laughs> I'm born, I'm married to a Bramley guy. Oh, I'm from Ottawa, my hometown. Ottawa citizen, my first job. Love Ottawa. I was just up there actually a couple of weeks ago, and I cannot believe how much Ottawa has changed. I left there in '97. Mm. I don't even recognize the place anymore. Mm -hmm. Ottawa has grown so much. So, welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. This is going to be a coast to coast and uh, North American conversation. So I yes. love it. It's going to be fantastic. Okay, so see people are still coming in. So we'll, let's give it another uh, few seconds, but then we're gonna. We're going to get this show on the road because we've got Why one hour and in. I know people are just chomping at the bit on this topic, I am sure. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Glyne, like Shine, Roberts McCabe. Um, it's one of those Welsh names, you know, I, I love my father and uh, <laughs> gave us all of us kids well, strong Welsh names to remember our heritage. Um, and I am the founder and president of the Roundtable. And um, this is our... Uh, bi-monthly, semi-monthly, I can't remember what the word is, and we do it two times a month, uh, Ask the Expert session, and I am just thrilled to be joined this month, because it is Pride Month, it is all about diversity, with uh, Michael Bach, who is the CEO of the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion, so we are going to hear a little bit more um, from Michael uh, in a minute, but just to let everybody know, uh, today's session is being recorded, and um, we will be keeping the lines on mute, but feel free to use the chat. I like to think of this as the expert was Clubhouse before Clubhouse actually started. Um, this is a chance for you to really get up close to people who are practitioners doing the work, have a point of view about uh, the topic at hand, and really ask your questions. Um, I've given Michael some questions that were top of mind for me, but I'm most interested in creating these sessions as spaces for all of us to kind of figure it out and unpack it. Leadership is complicated, it's complex, um, and uh, there's an opportunity for us to really dig in and, you know, what can we learn and, and what can we, um, you know, how can we expand our awareness on things? So I'm super pumped for the topic today. I do want to do a quick land acknowledgement from where I am. I am sitting in the city of Toronto, and I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations and Inuit and Métis peoples. So I um, want to acknowledge that and um, also thank Michael so much again for being here today. We kind of called this session Beyond Thoughts and Prayers. Um, we really wanted to kind of engage in terms of how all of us can take steps to really make a difference um, in our workplaces. And so I wanted to just kind of set the context, tell everybody a little bit, Michael, about yourself and the work of the Canadian Diversity and Inclusion um, uh, Organization, Centre, area, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what you do and what you're most excited about. Like what is, what is really exciting you um, over the next coming year? Tell us about that. 
Well, thank you, Glenn, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so CCDI, the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, we are an educational charity with the mandate of educating Canadians on the value of diversity and inclusion, which is lovely marketing speak. Uh, we work with employers. Um, we support employers on creating inclusive work environments, and that's employers of any size, uh, regional, municipal, national, international, um, and we do that through educational events that we put on throughout the year, as well as research and thought leadership that we put out. I have been working in the field for 15 years. Uh, originally, I was the head of diversity for KPMG, and I was also the deputy chief diversity officer for KPMG International for two and a half years. And uh, I have been working in, I, it's funny, you know, we, we talk about the field of diversity as a relatively young profession. Mm. <clears throat> I've been doing this work for 30 something years. He Yellow says, green. pulling, thank you. I've had a lot of work done. I'm using the blur feature on Zoom. Well, I've got, I've got my French Botox happening here. So That's right fantastic. Um, and, but it wasn't a job when I started. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 19, 20 years old, working with different LGBTQ2 plus organizations, this was not a job. No one got yeah. paid. Um, so when it became a job, when it became a profession, I sort of jumped at it and said, I want to do this. And I, I, you know, I'd worked in it up until then. Um, so I sort of took a left turn at Poughkeepsie and, uh, haven't looked back. Yeah. And I should, I neglected to mention, wrote a book to boot, Birds of All Feathers. What? This book? That book? <laughs> Great book and um, just definitely a terrific primer, I think, for people who are looking to, uh, as you say in your subtitle, do diversity and inclusion right. Um, I mean, it was interesting when we were having our pre-call a few weeks ago, you you pointed out to me that this, this session falls on the anniversary, two-week anniversary of um, George Floyd's killing. And, um, and then, you know, in that time between our call, we've had 215 children found in Kamloops, BC. Uh, we've had the horrific tragedy in London, Ontario of um, the five, uh, the five uh, individuals killed there. And so I guess I want to kind of ask you, you know, how you how do you feel the world has changed since the George Floyd event? To me, it doesn't feel like it's changed that much, given the light of the situation in the last couple of weeks. But as somebody who's been in this space um, for as long as you've been in, what are you seeing shifts? Oh, I, I do think there's been massive change. I think, you know, I always said that prior to George Floyd's death, I could not get an employer to talk about anti-racism. Mm -hmm. None of them wanted to actually acknowledge that racism existed in your workplace. Mm -hmm. He was killed and the next day my phone lit up like a Christmas tree mm -hmm. and we've spent a lot of time talking about racism, particularly anti-Black racism, anti-Indigenous racism, mm -hmm. uh, anti-Asian racism, thank mm -hmm. you, uh, COVID, mm -hmm. Um, and a former president whose yeah. name shall not pass my lips. Um, <laughs> a lot has changed. Employers have really woken up. Mm. I think the discovery of the, of the 215 uh, children in an unmarked grave in Cam British Columbia is another watershed moment. Yeah. George Floyd's death was a watershed moment, and this is another one that I think will drive significant change where employers are now actually reading the Truth and Reconciliation mm -hmm. Commission's report mm -hmm. and saying, okay, we, we can no longer issue a statement on Twitter if we haven't actually done anything. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing around reconciliation? What is, it, what is our job beyond a land acknowledgement, which I'm really glad you did. It's really important. It's not reconciliation. Mm -hmm. it's like stealing someone's someone's property and acknowledging you stole it, but not giving it back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we're, we see these moments and they are these water, I can't call it again, it's watershed moment mm -hmm. where so much is changing as a consequence. Yeah. That doesn't mean that the hate goes away. Yeah. You know, as you mentioned, on Sunday night, five, a family of five, three different generations, 
in London, Ontario, were mowed down by a driver um, who deliberately hit them. Four of them have passed. The youngest is in hospital, but they were killed because they're Muslim. Hate didn't magically go away. Mm -hmm. And it, it is a, a painful reminder that we need to continue to do the work yeah. um, to change hearts and minds around this topic. Yeah. 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 It's, it's such a, I think you're right. I think the word watershed, um, you can't unsee it. <clears throat> you can't look away from it. And I think that's making a lot of um, a lot of people uncomfortable, right? And it's okay to be uncomfortable. We grow when we're uncomfortable. I think that's the misnomer, right? Like I think Absolutely. that's what we have to embrace in this moment of, of discomfort is the fact that there is growth happening and that's the positive out of the discomfort, right? I agree, yeah. So yeah, like, so you, you mentioned that, you know, your phone's been lighting up, ringing off the hook. And I think one of the things that I just want to cover off the basics, you know, uh, I know there's probably some people in the audience that are really skilled in this. And maybe there's some people that are tuning in that this is, you know, they're new to all of this work and they want to kind of learn more. So I think sometimes it's really important to get the foundations right. So we keep talking about DE and I initiatives. And I thought right. it might be good for you to kind of share with us a few definitions so we're really clear on the key terms. So if we look at diversity versus inclusion as a starting point, what's the difference between diversity and inclusion? Um, yeah. So diversity is about the things that make us unique. It's about our sex or gender. It's about our ethnicity or race or sexuality, our religion. Frankly, it's about everything that makes us unique. It's about the language we speak. It's about where we live in the country, the world. Um, all of those things add up to make us who we are. Inclusion is about creating spaces, be they workplaces, schools, hospitals, where people can bring all of that stuff with them and feel safe and welcome and included. It's the two, and it's why we talk about diversity and inclusion together is you can't, can't or shouldn't have one without the other. You technically can have diversity without inclusion and you can yeah. have it inclusion without diversity. Yes. You shouldn't. The two things are supposed to go together yeah. so that we are embracing all of the difference around us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in its many forms. And we are, again, creating those spaces where people can feel welcome and supported and be successful. Mm -hmm. I think it. I think it's so important to acknowledge this inclusive because you're right. You could you could tick all the boxes. You could have women at the table. You could have minorities at the table. You could have different orientations. But if they're if their voices are not being heard, you know, you can have all kinds of diversity, but not that inclusion. And I think the other thing that has occurred to me over the last twelve months was. Um, when you are looking at it through your cultural lens. So in my case, it's a white straight lens that I look at the world through. And that just is, it's not because I'm a mean person or bad. It's just, that's, that's who I am. I'm a white straight woman, right? And so what I think of as inclusive might not be inclusive to others, right? Exactly. So I think that's one of the pieces that we really need to be aware of is that how you define inclusion, it's not up to you to define what inclusion is. It's up to the others around you that you're trying to include <laughs> to mm -hmm. see what does inclusion look like to them. And I think that's one thing that I had a big aha about this, this past 12 months for sure. So I love the, the separation of that. So now let's talk about equity versus equality. This right. And I was going to say that, that <laughs> what you just said leads perfectly into the conversation around equity. So the difference between equity and equality is... It, there's a tweet. <laughs> I can't believe I'm going to do this, but <laughs> there's a tweet that says equality is giving everyone a shoe. Equity is giving everyone a shoe that fits. Mm -hmm. Equality is about treating people the same, but it doesn't take into consideration that people have different needs. Equity is about considering the needs of the individual and treating them how they need to be treated. Mm -hmm. It's a subtle difference, but the biggest example I can give you, the sort of most dramatic one I've ever thought of is women have babies. 
men do not. Men are not, men admittedly in heterosexual biological relationships are involved in the process. It's a good couple minutes at most. And women are in for like nine months and then some. <laughs> Why are we treating men and women the same? In that instance, why would we possibly, do? I mean, maternity leave as a concept is largely about a woman healing from the birthing process. That's the first part. So, you know, that's just one example. There's lots of other examples. Um, and it's about making sure that people have what they need. So I, I'll give you another example. 48% of the city of Toronto uh, do not speak English or French at home. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say, well, they should. Absolutely, they should. But if, if English or, or French is not your first language, it's a lot easier to speak in your native language, mm -hmm. particularly in environments where everyone understands you. It's just easier on your brain. Yeah. That 48% that of the population, when they're engaging with, say, voting, the medical profession, um, any sort of civil, uh, civilly provided service, they might benefit from having forms in their language that they best understand yeah. so that there's no confusion when you give someone a cancer diagnosis and they're nodding away and they're not understanding. So it's about treating people how they need to be treated, not how you need to be treated. I love that you're bringing this up because I think one of the uh, one of the things that I had a really big aha about, and I have no solution for, but it was really I had uh, Bob Joseph on earlier this year. Here. Bob wrote the book, 21 Things You May Not Know About the Indian Act. And I thought he was being very generous. I said, Bob, you should have titled that 21 Things You Definitely Don't Know About the Indian yes. Act, right? Like nobody knows, right? And it's it's a wonderful book because it's super accessible mm -hmm. and, and Bob makes it so. But Bob was talking about um, just the value set that exists within the Indigenous, indigenous community. And what I really had a big aha on is how that is so at conflict with a lot of the values that sit within our corporate worlds, right? And, you know, just there are so many things that are culturally expected and that are that that when you look at it through the lens, um, you, and he had simple examples like, you know, eye contact, firm handshakes, things that you would expect to see in a job interview that you will not get from somebody whose culture is uh, not about, you know, uh, standing out or, or um, presenting yourself in that manner, you know, and I thought, boy, this is an issue. This is an issue for us um, in organizations because we are measuring everybody against a white tradition, male, white male military model in most organizations. Like it's a military yep. roots in military. I mean, that's why we have the hierarchy and the structures we have. Right? Well, and, and a settler model. Yes. It's 100%. a colonist model in North America. 100%. So, so I think that it's so like when we talk about the systemic nature of this, it is so deep and so embedded. And I, and so I love this sort of, uh, you know, this conversation about equity versus equality, because I think that's that's such a big piece of this puzzle um, for so many of us. So on that, you know, I think uh, how where can leaders start around this, you know, to, to create more diverse and inclusive teams and to keep this idea of equity and equality in mind? What what are some simple things that people can do? Because I think this can feel a little overwhelming. Absolutely. Uh, you know, first, start with your business case. And I realize some people will say, oh, the business case has been proven. No, it hasn't. If it had, four people would be alive today, bluntly. If it had, <laughs> women would not be making 76 cents on the dollar compared to a man in a similar job. Mm -hmm. The business case has not been proven. People mm -hmm. don't believe it still. So, and, and when I say write a business case, first of all, if it's more than a page, you've lost people. People have the attention span of goldfish, it should just be a page. Why does it matter? That's all you're answering. Right. It's not the specifics. It's not here's what we're going to do. It's not strategic points. It's just about um, uh, it's just about answering the why question. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, 
how do you know it matters? Right. How do you know? And, and arguably, I could write a business case for every single person on this call. I can come up with a business case for any organization, but it has to be organization specific. Mm -hmm. And then after that, conduct some form of assessment. And the assessment doesn't have to be this huge initiative and bringing in consultants and take, I mean, depending on how large you are as an organization, that may be the direction you need to go. There's any number of things, but the, the whole purpose of that is to understand what the problem is. And, and notoriously employers jump past this step and they'll call and then say, Oh, we need to have a, you know, a recruiting strategy to bring in more people of color. Great. How many people of color do you have today? You, you don't know. Okay. Well, you might want to know that mm -hmm. um, there, you know, you, you have to go through some form of assessment to understand what the problem is. Then you would, you come up with a strategy. What does, what, you know, what are the solutions to address the problems? So it may be you need, you need a recruiting strategy. It may be you need unconscious bias training. Who knows? There's any number yeah. of things. But if you don't know what the problem is, you don't know what the solution is. Right. And then measure it, figure out how you're going to measure each of those initiatives and rinse and repeat. Yeah. Go well, back and re redo your assessment and, you know, figure out if you've been successful, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of people who make this very complicated and it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. I think that's it too. Oh. And, 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 or, are looking for the quick fix. I mean, this is where, you know, to me, ah, yes. <laughs> let's give everybody that 90 minute bias training and then we're done. We can put the big check mark on because now everybody knows what their biases right. are, right? And so I love this idea of like being this very systematic approach and choosing, like you can't boil the ocean. What are you going to choose that's going to make a measurable difference? And are you starting in the right place? Like I think about, like I often talk to teams about what's the big bang for the buck behavior this team needs to fix. With individuals, we do the same thing. What's the one big bang for the buck behavior that's going to really accelerate? And it's the same, like it's the same with, what's the big bang for the buck on your DNI that it's actually going to change not just one thing, but you'll feed, I love this expression, you'll feed two birds with one seed, right? By doing oh, this I like initiative, that. right? Isn't that nicer than killing that's, them? That's own, much right? nicer than right? killing them. No, more. Uh, it, it, it is... There is no quick fix, right? Full stop. Just let it go. Don't, you yeah. know, th you're in it for the long haul. Yes. And this is, this is about culture change. This is yes. about dramatic culture change. And there are things that will be quicker to institute than others. Yeah. You'll see that beside my name, I've got my, my uh, uh, personal pronouns, he, him that's an easy fix to put that in your email signatures on your zoom profiles easy there are other things that take a lot more time yeah and you have to be prepared to invest the time yeah yeah so we've got a question we've got a couple of questions that come into the chat um so donica asks what is the difference between a dei strategic plan and a dei business plan mm -hmm. okay so it depends. There's two answers to this, Donka. Mm -hmm. um, it depends how people perceive them. Um, personally, I would look at those two things as interchangeable. That a strategic plan or a business plan. It's just about how are you going to fix the problems, issues, challenges, opportunities that you found as part of your assessment. Mm. It's the stuff. It's the tangible action items that you're going to focus on. Some people I've heard it said would say that the business plan is more along the lines of the business case. It's high level. It's aspirational goals. It's saying, okay, you know, we aspire to have 50% of our leadership be people of color by 2030. And then you're strategic plan is how are you going to get there? Mm. I think it depends on the organization, how you would define those two things. Yeah. A lot of this stuff is very organizationally specific. Mm. Um, it needs to speak the language that of your organization so that it doesn't seem like a foreign concept. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And it just depends on how you would, would view those terms. Taking out the DEI, would you have a business plan and a strategic plan or would you have just one? Yeah. Yeah. And the business plan part, what was coming up for me as you were talking, I was thinking, oh, I wonder, like, that's also like effect on community. And, and uh, you know, like I think about, you know, making real hardcore decisions about the kind of products and services you sell and vendors you work with. And, uh, you know, it could be, you know, broader than the strategy to get there. Right. Well, that's the, you know, that's the big picture of DEI. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not just an HR program. Yeah. I think that's, I think people see it as an HR program. Absolutely right? they do. But when you when you think about it, there are DEI aspects to your people, yeah, your customers, yes, your brand and marketing, yeah, your real estate, where your offices are, your technology, your suppliers. Yeah. A true DEI focus in an organization is kind of layered over everything that the organization does. Yeah. Um most people get stuck at the HR piece. Yeah, yeah, I can totally imagine that. All right, here's another question that came in. What is Michael's view of the recent article in the Globe and Mail by Joseph Heath entitled, the term BIPOC is a bad fit for the Canadian discourse on race? Oh, do I have an opinion? (laughs) Um, That you can say in, in polite company. (laughs) <laughs> um, well, I expressed it on Twitter when I saw it. I saw the article come out, uh, came out on the weekend and I uh, responded on Twitter and uh, was quite offended, actually, by the article. Can you give, can you give those in the audience yeah. who maybe didn't read the article just a quick nope. uh, 411 Absolutely. on it? And, uh... So in the article, Mr. Heath is suggesting that the term BIPOC, which stands for Black, Indigenous and People of Color, is inappropriate for Canada and that we should be using the term FIVM, Francophone, Indigenous, and Visible Minority. Mm. Um, Mr. Heath, from my, through my eyes, appears to be a white man. I was a little offended that the Globe decided that they thought a white man should be a white man who doesn't work in diversity and inclusion, let's add that caveat, since I am a white man, uh, felt the need to uh, publish this opinion piece. There there are so many problems with this article. For him, it's all about representation. Mm. And he was saying that why are Black people first when they only make up three and a half percent of the Canadian population, and then you've got Indigenous people at five percent, and then you've got people of color that make up uh, 20 something percent. What he completely missed was that the reason why black and indigenous people are first is that they face significantly higher levels of oppression and systemic racism in society. On top of that, to suggest that somehow Francophone people with all due respect are in anywhere that the same type of place around treatment is offensive and absurd. And he doesn't seem to understand that the term visible minority is one that is very much out of vogue, largely because the United Nations in 2007 deemed it to be a racist term. Mm -hmm. Um, There are so many problems with that article, but To my opinion on the term BIPOC, first of all, I do not like the term, and I'll tell you why. I do not like reducing people to an initialism or an acronym. Mm. I think that is too simplistic. Um, I think it's important for us to say the words Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, I, it's just not a, a good feeling. I do believe we need a specific focus on anti-Black racism. I do believe we need a specific focus on anti-Indigenous racism. Um, as we heard, 250 bodies. That's one residential school. Yeah. Mark my words, this is the beginning of a monumental movement where we will release, we will find thousands of unmarked graves across the country. Mm-hmm. And that's why 
we need to have indigenous peoples front and center. We also need to have black people front and center as much as they are a very small percentage of the population in comparison to others, they experience higher levels of racism than any other group. Mm -hmm. How many on this call have ever been stopped by the police because they didn't think that they could afford the car they were driving? It's never happened to me, yeah. but it's happened to a lot of black people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm not a fan of just um, reducing people to an initialism. I think it is dismissive of their identity and their experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and I feel like when we do that, then we need to start putting white in everything too. Like if you're gonna start labeling people that way, then start, you know, start, it, like it, to me, it comes from that place of privilege of being and standing in the white and everybody else, right? So there, right. anyway, the, that, that's um, interesting. I had not heard that five them before. So uh, I <laughs> educated on that today. Yikes. Um, okay, so another uh, um, question is coming from Guillaume, who asks, do you recommend we use a third party vendor to survey our employer employees to better understand the composition of our workforce or we do it internally? If the latter, can you share where we can find a complete survey that includes all key diversity dimensions we want to survey people on, including sexual orientation, et cetera? So what do you recommend on this? Is it better to have an outsider come in and help or is it better to do a homegrown version of this? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I will tell you that um, when I was at KPMG, um, we became the first employer in Canada to survey our people beyond the questions required under employment equity. So we asked about sexual orientation and gender identity and many other things. Um, in retrospect, I would have done that with a third party. Mm -hmm. um, How come? Largely, uh, yeah, a couple of reasons. One, um, it was impossible with our HR systems to ensure that the data was anonymous. Right. I and another person were able to see how every single person responded to every question. Mm. And I had to sign a privacy commitment and, you know, give up my firstborn and do all sorts of things to make sure <laughs> I wouldn't reveal the information. Mm -hmm. But that gave me a lot of power. And frankly, it wasn't that comfortable for me to have that. Um, the second is about trust. Yeah, that's what came asking, up to mind as soon as you said that. I thought depends on where the trust is in the organization, yeah. right? It it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to build up that level of trust to get people to understand that you're not. It's not about discrimination. It's not about you know you're not going to be firing people because they identify as living with a mental illness or or queer or whatever. In, and that takes time. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually recommend a third party. I've seen employers do it internally. There isn't a survey that you can buy that says, here are all the questions. You have to build it yourself. And mm -hmm. the survey providers out there, ourselves included, because this is a service we offer, we do not share that survey uh, because it's intellectual property. Right. Um, you can build it yourself. The thing I would say is do not follow StatsCam. <laughs> they are woefully out of date. Mm. And I'll give you an example. On the, on the census, you can identify as Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and I think Filipino. And then you have South Asian as a bucket. <laughs> so why are we specifically why? calling out yeah. those four countries? And South Asia, largest, uh, the largest population of immigrants to Canada come from South Asia, specifically India. Um, it, it, they're just outdated, woefully outdated, and they need an update. Um, so I, I would say you can you can poke around online, you can find different versions, you can hire someone like me to provide you guidance on it. Um, uh, but I would say you are better off having a third party vendor do it. Uh, specifically around trust. 
Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because we do 360 surveys and I would say it's a similar thing, right? Like the whenever, whenever we go in where people have had a homegrown 360, you know, depending on how it was used, who saw it, you know, there, there can be all kinds of questions about that. So I want to kind of shift gears, but you brought up the, the uh, you know, pronoun piece um, earlier. And so this is Pride Month and, you know, uh, all celebration of all kinds of the spectrum of sexuality and, and uh, uh, you know, everything that um, we've been talking about today. It makes me think a lot about you know, Jordan Peterson, um, a few years ago, made a big stir about not wanting to, you know, use, be forced to use these pronouns and da da da. And it's funny, because I said to Bob Joseph about land acknowledgement, when I was talking to him, I said, you know, sometimes I feel and this is my own kind of, I think it's, it's the issue, I will say for me around being white and not wanting to do the wrong thing and feeling like, is it, is this a good thing? Cause I've read where some people say it's performative and other people say you should be doing it. Like you, you see all these conflicting opinions within the communities that it's coming from. And so I, you know, I said that to Bob about, um, you know, the land acknowledgement, like this, you know, is this performative? And I, had the same kind of question for you, you know, that adding the she and the her, when I am a white straight woman, is that me being performative? Is that me being supportive? Jordan Peterson saying, don't force this down my throat. What, give me the take on this and, and how should we be yeah. thinking about this? Because I think it's, you know, there is a lot of mess out there. So talk to us yes. about pronouns. So Jordan, this thing. yeah, Jordan Peterson's an idiot. Um, <laughs> And, and you can quote me on that. Um, we change names all the time. Mm. You go from miss to Mrs. Mm. Um, or a Ms. I'm a Ms. Or Ms. Ms. Right. right? Yeah. Um, uh, Cassius Clay changed his name to Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. Do you think anybody still called him Cassius? Mm -hmm. Not if they wanted to keep their teeth. <laughs> I wonder if his mom um, <laughs> Probably, but you know, when she said Cassius, he was in trouble. Yeah, yeah, probably, um, right? It is not performative to include your pronouns and your email signature in your Zoom profile at the beginning of a presentation because it's not about you. When I say my personal pronouns are he, him, his, it's not about me. I'm not trying to make sure that everyone genders me properly mm -hmm. because I present as male. I have a bit of scruff. I wear suits. Um, you know, I am, I am male presenting. It's about creating space for trans folk, for people that do not fit the binary, the norm, mm -hmm. this little world we live in of male and female, women and men. Um, it's about making sure that if you are trans, if you're non-binary, you're genderqueer, however you identify that this is a space where you can be yourself. And I'm sending a message in that, yeah, that I've taken the time that. to include that in my profile says, if you tell me your pronouns are they, them, I will refer to you as they, them. And I will respect that. And coming back to Peterson, not just to call him a name, it was about a lack of respect he had for his students mm -hmm. that he couldn't take the time to understand a person's gender and to acknowledge them how they identify just shows a real lack of respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I love that. I love this, you know, it because I have a teenage daughter who I would say is way more actualized than I was at 17. I mean, phenomenal sort of insight into this. And, uh, you know, we, we had a great discussion about it over the dinner table one night. And I think this notion, yes, it is not about you. You sit in privilege because you fit into one of these gendered boxes that we have on the washroom signs and yep. on the tick boxes or are you, you know, this and that. And I think that, and I love this idea that, you know, that is what you're doing is you're creating space for other people to have that um, same privilege, right? Um, or the privilege that we're sitting in, right? Letting go of that. Well, and I'm using my privilege to the advantage of others. Yeah. Because when yes. I'm in an organization and I see that they only have gendered washrooms of yeah. man and woman, I'm able to say, 
where is your gender neutral restroom? I'm able to push that envelope because again, as a cisgendered man, I have a lot of privilege in a room. Yeah. And it's about using your privilege to the advantage of others. Yes. And I think, you know, and I think washrooms is one great example, right? Like my daughter goes to a high school in Toronto that has gender neutral washrooms. And, um, you know, and that was for her, that inclusive culture that, you know, that, um, I mean, I just find a kids, a kids at the same, well, certainly for her and the experiences she's had far more like whatever mom, like this is the way the world is. Um, what do you think when we think about in workplaces, I mean, washrooms is like one easy target, but what are some other systemic things that we may not think about that create barriers for other people that, you know, we could use our voices for or be mindful of? Oh my gosh, how long do we have? Um, <laughs> I think there are so many things um, about using privilege to the advantage of others. Um, so for example, if you're in a meeting and someone says something, makes a suggestion, be they a woman, a person of color, a person with a disability, whatever, and they're ignored, it's your responsibility to make sure that they're heard, mm -hmm. to say, hold on a second, didn't Glenn just say that? Because usually, and women will contest it, attest to this, that you know, a woman will say something, it'll get ignored, a man will say the exact same thing, and you'd think he'd invented fire. It's, you know, the point is to say, hold on, I think Klein just said that exact thing. Let's talk about that and and make sure that you're using that privilege to the advantage of the other. If you hear a homophobic, racist, sexist comment or joke you have a responsibility to stand up to that. Yeah. And again, particularly if you are a white man, straight, white, able-bodied man, use your privilege to say, that's not okay here. Mm -hmm. But until someone says something, the behavior continues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we promote what we permit. Yeah. And so it's, you know, you have to, first of all, you have to understand your privilege. You have to understand what privilege is. And there's lots of different types of privilege that we could talk about, be they sexuality or gender or race, be they financial, location, education. There's a long list mm -hmm. of potential privileges. And, and most people have some privilege in some way, shape or form. But once you understand your privilege, it's about using your privilege. And if you understand your privilege and you don't use it to the advantage of others, you are just as guilty as anyone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so many people get triggered by the word privilege, right? They'll say, but I had a hard life. I've had hard times, right? And, and no one's denying that. that? Mm -hmm. Talk to no me one's denying that. that. There are, so let's look at the, the intersection of privilege. So... Being white is a privilege. First of all, let me back up for a second. You can't get rid of privilege. Mm -hmm. There is no way for you and or I to take away our whiteness. I have two colors, white and red. That's it, because of the burning in the sun. Yeah, I'm um, with you. <laughs> right. Um, I can't take this off. No more than could a black person take off their race. Mm -hmm. You can't, privilege is given to you whether you want it or not. Mm -hmm. So understand, just accept that and, and move on. That's sort of the first stage of, of grief on privilege. Yeah. Um, the second thing, when I look at the intersectionality of privilege, so let's talk about the privilege of race and the privilege of, of money. So I'm white. And if you take two white people, they do not necessarily come from the same privilege. We can't treat people as, as one. So I grew up at Young and Davisville in Toronto, very wealthy neighborhood, I, very much in a middle upper income bracket. That's my story. If you grew up in 
a lower economic bracket where, you know, maybe you had a single parent, maybe they were working two jobs. I have economic privilege and you don't. That doesn't take away your white privilege. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's also not a contest. Mm -hmm. The impression Olympics have never been won by anybody where we start to compare and say, oh, I'm more, I'm more oppressed. Yeah. I came out as gay in 1987. You want to talk about oppression? Yeah. Does that compare to the experiences of a black or indigenous person today? No, but I'm not trying to compare. I don't want to win this game. Yeah. Yeah. It, one thing does not um, necessarily Ooh. impact the other, mm -hmm. nor should it. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's, it's okay to, you know, if you grew up in hard financial times, I get it. That's, you know, that sucks. I didn't have that. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's such a thing for people to wrap their head around. You know, I think we really have to sit and go, you're not, it's, it's about you, everybody's got different levels of privilege and that, 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 that is exactly it is what it is however i think that for a lot of people they feel like it's negating those stories by saying that you have privilege because you're white or that you're a white male i teasingly teasingly call my husband the agent of oppression because you can put everything pin everything on the straight white male right um I, I keep telling i keep threatening to getting a t-shirt um but I think that that's the, that's the part that um, as white people, we have to just get over, let it go. I think a lot of, and I think there's a lot of, like speaking as myself, you know, there's a lot of anger too, because there's a lot of things you feel like you weren't taught, you weren't told, you were, you were kept in your privilege bubble. And now all of a sudden we're getting confronted with it and it's not nice. And we feel badly, like there's shame that, you know, people are feeling right now because we feel we feel ashamed and we feel like, you know, this is our fault. And, and I don't feel like that's a super productive place for, for people to be like, I get it. But I think if you're sitting in shame, it's not necessarily going to be the part that's going to help us um, move, move everything forward the way we need to move things forward. And one of the things that I feel like gets a bit conflicted. So I would love your sort of take on this. And I've been thinking about this as we've been having the conversation is I think, and I'll, and I'll talk about myself, I feel like sometimes I'm afraid to make a misstep. I'm afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm worried. And, and we're told like, it's not another race or another, you know, person's um, responsibility to educate you, white person. You got to go educate yourself. Okay, so I'm educating myself but now then I make a misstep, but now I'm told, well, I shouldn't be educating you on this. You need to work, but like there's blind spots and you don't know, and you don't know how you're going to be in situation. And even as, I, even as I'm saying this to you, I feel like I'm being a whiny white person, right? Like suck it up buttercup. Like this is called being uncomfortable, get used to it. Right. But I, th I feel like there's a bit of that hesitancy and I've watched it in my Facebook feed with friends where, you know, somebody will post something and then immediately they start getting attacked, right? And they start getting, you know, there's a sort of almost cancel culture, like you did this wrong and I'm not going to talk to you or I'm going to get slim, right? And so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious for, you know, how would you help people move beyond this? Like if people are feeling stalled by this or they're not sure how to do it, or they have, maybe they have a situation where it didn't go so well and now they're kind of recoiling back from it. What, what kind of wisdom, advice, mentorship would you share? So first off, guilt is a useless emotion. Mm -hmm. It serves no purpose. It does not help the person who's feeling guilty, and it does not help the person who they're feeling guilty about. Um, I recognize guilt is a real thing. I'm married to a Catholic. If I could bottle <laughs> it, I'd be a rich man. There, that's a whole new flavor yeah, of, yeah, of that's guilt. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. Um, it's not going to help. So at some point, it's in your best interest to let go of that guilt. I was, I delivered some training a, a couple of years ago and someone said, you know, I feel really guilty about being white. Mm. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Do others feel that half the room put up their hands? Mm. And I was stunned at that because I have never felt guilty about being white because I cannot do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
if you can do something about it and you don't do something about it, then you should feel guilty. Right. But since you can't, let it go. Um, I absolutely disagree with the whole cancel culture mm. and how toxic the internet is mm. with, you know, if, if my opinion doesn't align with, with yours, with a particular group that somehow I get canceled, that you can, you know, get me off the internet. I disagree with that because I think it invalidates people's opinions. It makes them scared. They don't share, which is completely the opposite because you don't learn if you're not willing to express yourself. That's right. I think the right thing to do if someone says something inappropriate is to treat it as a learning moment and say, hey, here's how this was maybe inappropriate. Here, here's how this was maybe a bit offensive. You might want to consider this. It is the individual's responsibility to learn, to educate themselves. So if you want to be an anti-racist, read uh, uh, Kendi X. Abrams' book, uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's a Great brilliant book. book. Great book. But don't think that you magically become the perfect anti-racist for reading that book. Yeah. It's the, I think the key is to have some Mm self-awareness about your behavior, about those moments. So if you say something and someone calls you on it, you learn from that moment and say, well, I am so sorry. That was not my intention. Let's talk about it. I think. There's a difference between expecting a marginalized person to be the educator and engaging in a conversation and learning from it. So this happened, I don't know how many times, um, particularly with black people after George Floyd was killed, that a lot of people of color, um, their employers said to them, you've got to help us fix, you know, deal with racism. Right. And so the role of educator was pushed on people. On them. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about people who have been traditionally marginalized, who are traumatized, who are, are you know, dealing with a lot of their own stuff. And now you expect them to fix the mess, fix mess yeah, that you yeah, made. Yeah. That's wrong. Yeah. At the same yeah. time, if you say something in front of a Black colleague and maybe it's inappropriate, and they call you on it, you know, that's your learning moment. And I would say that one of the things that I do with with my team constantly is I say, I'm still learning too. Mm -hmm. We are all learning. I don't have the lived experience of a person of color or a woman or a trans person. I have my lived experience. So if I say something that's inappropriate, if I do something that's inappropriate, call me on it so I can learn from it. Yeah, I love that. I mean, I I think it's interesting because we have a research partner that looks at the behavior and they just did some research recently where they were looking at what are the behaviors that leaders need to demonstrate to demonstrate inclusivity. And there were two kind of correlating behavior. I mean, one was empathy. So being empathetic and caring, genuine caring for people. But the the other two is that one was a behavior that they call consensual, which is about proactively seeking other people's input and involvement and then correlated with a lower score and another behavior which was self self is like I look to myself to make decisions I'm the person in charge and so it was this notion that you know inclusivity you need to be proactive about getting curious being inquisitive bringing other people along and then taking their input and adapting the way this is these are sort of the you know kind of the the behaviors that we can all sort of model and demonstrate boy i can see where we are at time we've got one more question that's come in um so let's get to that and then oh, i feel like we need a part two. Oh my goodness <laughs> Uh, an encore presentation with Michael. Okay, so um, we've got an attendee who's asking, where does ageism fit into this? So we're talking about all kinds of other equalities, but age is something that's rarely addressed. So did, what, what are your thoughts on ageism and um, how that fits into discrimination and what we're talking well, about? Today? Ageism fits firmly into the conversation around diversity. And we see age, ageism, sometimes we see the bias in favor of older people, and sometimes we see bias 
in favor of younger people. Right. Um, and I, I think about like some of the organizations I've worked with in the entertainment industry or the advertising industry where, you know, I would be the oldest person in the room by far. Um, it, it is a big problem. Ageism is a big problem. Um, because on one hand, we need to respect the fact that people have a certain level of experience. And that experience, if you've learned from it properly, is valuable. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we want the new ideas from young people. So you have to figure out how you create that balance um, where um, uh, this balance where everyone is respected and welcomed. We don't shut down young people by saying, oh, you're so young. You don't know what you're yeah. talking about. And we don't shut down old people, older, excuse me, people by <laughs> saying, yeah, whatever, Someone boomer. Someone called me a boomer once. I was like, I'm Ooh. not even close to a boomer, but you know, <laughs> suck it for being rude. Um, so I think, uh, um, yeah, that is is a distinct problem. It doesn't get addressed enough. Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, this, this, you know, this has been so rich and I'm seeing that there's some questions in the chat that we didn't get to. I feel like we need to probably, let's get you back in, in the fall and great. Like, let's Love do to. another round of this. I think it would be great. Such, such, such important conversations. So, um, Michael, what what do you want to say to the group that you haven't had a chance to share? I'll give you the last word. Um, what do you want to share? Before we Other than buy my book? No. <laughs> um, I got a plug for your book coming up. Uh, you know, I think the biggest thing I would say, the biggest lesson is don't be afraid to make a mistake. Mm. It's okay. You're First of all, you're going to. Guarantee that you know, is, is absolutely going to happen. Just be willing to, to learn from those mistakes that um, we're all on this journey of learning, which I think is pretty awesome, frankly. And no one has all the answers. No one's perfect. It, you're going to make mistakes. The question is, what do you do when you make a mistake? How do you learn from that? Mm -hmm. And I, I think if we can all start from that place of flawed individuals, we're far more able to create inclusive spaces uh, as opposed to thinking that someone is perfect. I'm not perfect, uh, which I know surprises everyone, but I am, <laughs> I am not perfect when none of us are. No. So be willing to make those mistakes. And uh, that's the first step. I love it. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, yes, get Michael's book, Birds of All Feathers. And there is the address for the CCDI website. Um, so take yourself there, check out all the great work that they're doing. And I know Michael would um, absolutely welcome any questions about the services they offer, but uh, definitely the book is a great place to start. And I think Michael, what you've shared today is so many great small steps that people can take. It does not have to be boil the ocean stuff. We can all do small things, including using our voices, right? Mm -hmm. um, for those of you interested in learning more about us, you can visit our website. We are group coaching, group mentoring, team coaching experts. We love building the collective and it being in this work together. Um, if you want to grab um, a seat in our next roundtable for leaders cohort, we are enrolling for the fall. It's a um, virtual program. So you can be anywhere in the country. This one group is a director VP level cohort launches in November. You can ask Shelby, Shelby um, for more info. We've only got three seats left in that one. It caps out at eight. Uh, there's my book. If you want to do it yourself, I put a, together a book on how you can create your own community. Maybe you can create a community with leaders who want to be changing more and creating more inclusive workspaces in your organization. This would give you a bit of a, a framework to how to start that. So I encourage you to look at that. And then finally, at the end of this month, we have Nitu Gudara, who is actually one of our roundtable grads. She is the co-founder of Socialite Vodka. As we go into uh, the summer, um, we're going to hear about her journey um, going from corporate into 
her own career as a entrepreneur. So I know it's going to be a dynamic conversation um, with a view from the C-suite around career shifting. So thank you all so very much. Um, thank you the, for those of you who put in questions. And thank you, Michael, for um, being with us today and sharing your insights, your passion, and um, all the work you're doing. And I know for those of you on the call, this has been recorded. We will be sending it out. I'll be sending out also my top takeaways and direct contacts for Michael, how to buy his book and all of those kinds of good things. So, and I think I'll also use the link, also include the link for Bob Joseph's um, presentation back in oh, yeah. February, because yeah, it was great. terrific. Um, those of you wanting to mm -hmm. kind of also deep dive into um, Indigenous, it was a really great conversation as well. So thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Thank sure you. Merci beaucoup.